Could you please welcome Lord Putnam? Thank you very much indeed. Thank you for that very nice introduction. It's a, a real pleasure to have been asked back to speak to you uh, today. It's now almost 15 years since I made the decision to leave the movie business and engage full-time with the very different and somewhat more challenging world of education. Now, if I'm left with any one disappointment regarding the public policy environment I've encountered, it would have to be the seeming absence of what's probably best described as wisdom. I think it's fair to say that for many people, wisdom, certainly political wisdom, has been something of an old-fashioned concept. But equally, there'll be very few among you who don't have a clear sense of what it involves and the way in which the lack of it impacts all of us. One of many interesting roles in recent years has been to serve as an advisor to the government of Singapore in matters relating to what are termed the creative or the digital industries. A few months ago, I had breakfast with the most senior of the civil servants with whom I work. He recently retired and I asked him how he was getting on. He told me he'd just returned from representing his government at a very high level economic conference in China. The conference lasted two weeks, the first three days of which were devoted to a series of what he described as having been riveting lectures on the past 5,000 years of Chinese history. And this, he explained, was intended to supply the context within which many of the assumptions of the following 10 days could be tested and discussed. What he made clear is that China has no intention of repeating the mistakes of the past, mistakes which led to each historical phase of that country's development being undermined or even destroyed by internal convulsions. I think it's also true to say that the Western world seems to have remarkably little concept of the pace and the quality of scientific, technological and cultural development that are accompanying the rise of China in this early part of the 21st century. So much so that we seemed almost surprised when a few weeks ago the Chinese decided to think twice about participating in any bailout of the Eurozone. They appear quite reasonably to have asked the question, where are the jobs and the consequent economic growth to come from that allows us confidence that these ballooning debts of yours are ever going to be repaid? Now, in seeking an answer, I turned to a relatively recent OECD report which observed that if the UK could do no more than simply equal Finland's educational performance, it would, over the lifetime of one generation, be around 4,500 billion pounds richer. I'll just repeat that figure because it blew me away. 4,500 pounds richer. Now, that's simply another way of saying that aside from any broader societal benefits, the educational performance of a country is a key determinant of its wealth. Now, this would suggest that if we in the UK wish to remain remotely competitive in the 21st century, renewed investment in education, education in general, and ICT in particular, becomes absolutely critical to any possibility of success. Yet, reading the speech the Secretary of State for Education delivered in Cambridge last week, he seems to have arrived at a somewhat different conclusion. At one level, I find it hard, if not impossible, to argue with a great deal of what he says. Michael Grove is unquestionably a genuine intellectual, whereas I'm stuck with being a, a deep-rooted pragmatist. Of course, you'll have the opportunity to listen to and question him a little later this afternoon. But this is what he had to say last week. I want to proclaim the importance of education as a good in itself. I want to argue that introducing the young minds of the future to the great minds of the past is our duty. I want to argue that we should be more demanding of our education systems, demanding of academics, head teachers, professionals in schools and students of all ages. We should recover something of that Victorian earnestness which believes that an audience would be gripped more profoundly by a passionate hour-long lecture from a gifted thinker, which ranged over poetry and politics, than by cheap sensation and easy pleasures. He also correctly underlines his belief that education cannot be reduced to little more than a handmaiden of the economy, as he put it. If we are to recapture and reclaim the importance of liberal learning, we must always state that education is a good in itself. And our anxiety to explain, as I have to, why a focus on educational excellence makes sense economically, I must make sure that I do not fall into the trap of justifying learning only in utilitarian or instrumentalist economic terms. I acknowledge that one of the reasons we want economic growth is to ensure that the place of learning in our culture and civilization is protected and enlarged. Now, 
That's all very fine, except that he never ventures into how all of his desiderata should be most compellingly taught. In my judgment, the Victorians that he invokes would have given their collective eye teeth for a fraction of the myriad teaching and learning opportunities technology offers us today. I'm convinced that Dickens and Wagner would have been among the very first people to grab the opportunities offered by the creation of any number of wonderful movies. His other cultural touchstones, Jane Austen, George Eliot, Balzac, Thomas Hardy, would all, I believe, have sought to write compelling television drama. Maybe one of them would have written the script for Downton Abbey had that opportunity existed. By my reading, Michael Gove's speech doesn't once mention the educational potential of technology of any kind. In fact, his speech is something of a landmark for politicians in that he never once mentions the word internet, web, or even digital. Now, this must surely be an act of conscious avoidance. He's entirely silent on the huge leaps that have been made in the means by which the very best of his ambitions can be delivered to ever larger audiences. It's possible to believe that he sees technology-assisted learning as a passing peculiarity of our modern age. Now, I don't for one moment believe that to be the case. In fact, some of his speeches, in which he makes reference to the positive impact of technology, strongly suggest that he has come to recognise its benefits. But if he really feels the need to look back to the Victorian age as some sort of gold standard, I'd very much like to introduce him to people like Thomas Edison, who quickly grasped the potential of moving images to assist learning. Not long after the birth of cinema, Edison predicted that the principal value of the new medium would be as an educational tool. As he then put it, it may sound curious, but the money end of the movies never hit me the hardest. The feature that did appeal to me about the whole thing was its educational possibilities. I had some glowing dreams about what the camera could be made to do and ought to do in teaching the world things it needed to know and teaching it in a more vivid and direct way. A few years later, the American president, Woodrow Wilson, went even further, calling the then silent cinema the very highest medium for the dissemination of public intelligence. And having viewed the first blockbuster movie, Birth of a Nation, he declared it as having been history written in light, lightning. So I asked, does the Secretary of State honestly believe that those responses were simply fashionable aberrations? Or did he think that should we choose to ignore the teaching and learning potential offered by the digital world, that the same will be true of the Finns, the Koreans, the Chinese, let alone should they ever wake up from their current educational slumber, the Americans? Of course he doesn't. Which only serves to make the silence of this very thoughtful man all the more puzzling. Now, the central challenge of my own work over Lord knows how many years has been to argue for and promote creativity and innovation in ways that ensure our education system at every level remains relevant to the collective needs of a society that is in itself changing in ways that at times, I've got to admit, I find quite bewildering. And by that, I'm referring to the type of creativity that builds on the lessons of history, of experience, and the likely economic and social needs of the next 20 to 30 years. As all of you are keenly aware, it is digital technology that's likely to be the driving force behind many or even most of the challenges and changes that I'm referring to. However, addressing them is going to require not only well thought through and continuing policy of investment, but also a vision or at least a framework that's sufficiently coherent to ensure that those policies right across government are robust enough to keep pace with digital developments in other technologically advanced and ambitious nations. For, as we've now discovered, the advent of high-speed broadband in educational institutions of every kind opens the door to a faster, richer, more interactive, and more informative internet experience than has ever been possible with what we've thought of as conventional broadband capacities. The truth is that the streaming of videos, plays, movies, animation, documentaries, concerts, and so forth can now be seamlessly incorporated into day-to-day -day learning. Surely a large part of our task is to explore and to harness all of these opportunities in addressing the many challenges we have as a global and digital society. By way of example, many of those currently in primary education are likely to spend much of their working lives in environments absolutely dominated by voice recognition technology. 
with all the productivity benefits along with the changes in working practice that this will inevitably bring. But let's be honest. When was the last time you heard anybody even raise that as an educational issue, let alone as a problem? And yet the concept of oracy was specifically developed almost 50 years ago by a British educationist, Andrew Wilkinson, specifically to help identify the importance of oral skills in education. Surely, Michael Gove, who in his recent speech repeatedly invokes the great Athenian orator Pericles, would be among the first to recognize and celebrate the importance of developing oral skills. What better way to do so than by introducing into the classroom the the pedagogy required to optimize voice-driven technology? And before anyone's tempted to shove that back in the too difficult box, take a quick look at what the world's leading technology companies are already doing. Google Voice is already standard on the latest Android phones. Apple has just introduced its Siri system with the iPhone 4S. And just last week, Amazon bought its own voice recognition technology company in the United States. Now, needless to say, this technology is not as yet remotely perfect. As ever, there's a sometimes tortuous path that leads from creation through technology hype to widespread adoption, followed inevitably by the tangible impact on productivity. But I'd argue that whatever way you look at it, Here's a pedagogical challenge that by 2020 could either help or, if we funk it, very badly hurt us. I don't think I'm being wholly unfair in suggesting that there's been something of an institutionalised reluctance, or is it resistance, among politicians as well as teachers and educationists to fully embrace and optimise the potential of digital innovation and, as a consequence, the increasing disparity has been allowed to open up between life in the lecture hall or the classroom and the daily experience of technology beyond the school and college gates. To my mind, the roots of the profound change which many of those working in education are being challenged to address run very, very deep. And one of the casualties is that technology has not as yet been allowed to make anything like the significant impact on the process of teaching and learning as has proved possible in most other fields of human activity. We simply have to know more about the learning potential of every young person we seek to teach. And that's not just a stage line. That is a very, very personal issue for me. The title of this conference, Every Child Has Talent, believe me, was a million miles away from the thinking of my teachers when I left school in 1957. With the exception of Miss Kirkpatrick, my history teacher, I was written off with my three O-levels and got rid of as quickly as possible as a talentless git. I, and I make, I'm not proud of this. No one bothered to think that possibly a kid who had 93% at his O level in history, and I think it was 82% in English literature, and who just scraped through English language, was anything other than dumb. No one thought maybe there was a read across between really quite exceptional uh, achievement almost, I'd say, in a couple of subjects was weird when I actually got 5% in maths. Double the irony that I spent 30 years of my life as a film producer involved only in maths. Um, But the world moves on. I've continued to find it incredibly difficult to persuade policymakers that if we are to win back the trust and the respect of our students, we need to develop a far better sense of the challenges they face and we need to engage far more effectively with their world to learn to view technology and the way in which they relate to it through their eyes. To see the digital environment as they do, as transformative, not simply as some kind of useful add-on, but as something that's already changed the nature of the way in which they go about their daily lives, and indeed the way in which they learn and can be helped to respond to learning. Another example, coding. Without an understanding of its key component, that's to say code, ICT will inevitably remain badly taught never much more than the 21st century equivalent of being taught to change the typewriter ribbon and apply a bit of tipex. And yet the key to ICT is to understand coding and everything that goes into the creation of what appears on your computer screen. That's probably why Alex Hope, the co-author of the Next Gen report on skills for the visual effects and video game sector, referred to coding just this week as the new Latin. Or as Ian Livingstone, the other author of the report, put it in an article in The Independent on Monday, 
Computer science is to ICT what writing is to reading. It is the difference between making an application and using one. It's the combination of computer programming skills and creativity by which the world-changing companies such as Google, Facebook, Twitter, and Zynga allow themselves to be built. Indeed, in a world where computers define so much of the way in which society works, I would argue that computer science is an essential knowledge for the 21st century. And if, we're to grasp, if we fail to grasp and act upon what Ian, Alex, and others are saying, then the possibility that we can compete and succeed simply evaporates. This surely is one of the keys to creating not just a new generation of digital entrepreneurs, but thousands and thousands of well-paid and thoroughly satisfying jobs. Ignore this opportunity, and the only certainty is that we won't be able to create the kind of companies the United States has successfully developed, and more importantly, that other parts of the world are simply racing past us in developing. Yet, when it was published at the end of last week, the government response to the next gen report was described by one trade magazine, accurately in my view, as being lukewarm. In their seemingly obsessive desire to move away from anything resembling a centralized strategy in favor of a potentially chaotic version of autonomy, and with a nod to the Secretary of State's golden age of learning, they even mentioned dropping ICT from the curriculum altogether, albeit hinting at the possibility of in some way wrapping computer science within the broad ambit of what we know as ICT. Without being politically partisan, I'd like to think that my own party will pick up this ball and run with it, or at least start pressing the coalition to wake up and smell the coffee. This is probably as good a moment as any to raise the fact that during the course of the many, many years I've been pursuing this argument, these affordable yet powerful technologies have become absolutely embedded in the everyday lives of a whole new generation of teachers. That being the case, why on earth are we making such heavy weather? of transforming learning. At its heart, the problems surrounding the adoption of advanced technologies as part and parcel of day-to-day teaching practice stem, I believe, from two very different approaches to the technology itself. The first seems to me designed to support and reinforce existing, or in many cases, outdated practices, some of which are only changing at a glacial pace. In some respects, it's a little bit like putting the man with the red flag back in front of each automobile and encouraging him to jog a little more quickly. Merely digitizing old practices is, in effect, simply seeking to get the same or similar results, but a little quicker. All of which, I believe, takes us to the heart of the problem. If all you do with technology is use it to support existing methodologies and practice, then why and on what possible basis would you expect new or significantly better results? I've long been suggesting to anyone who listened that those driving educational improvement would do well to consider what a major positive and creative disruption in learning and teaching might look like. That's to say, what advances could an entire digital pedagogy achieve as opposed to simply digitizing the existing curriculum. And it's with these quite enormous challenges in mind that I hope you won't mind if I restate what I see as the crucial lessons everyone working in education ought to have absorbed in our efforts to create a more successful society in an ever more difficult world. And when I use the term successful, like Michael Gove, I'm not simply alluding to economic success. Firstly, like it or not, getting education right is far more than simply one among a number of important priorities. It is, insofar as the future of this or any other country is concerned, far closer to being the whole ball of wax. Secondly, and this can never be repeated often enough, and you'll hear it time and time again, I'm sure, from this podium, no education system can be better than the quality of the teachers it employs. But I'd add, and the ever-improving standards it's prepared to demand of them and to reward them for. Thirdly, teacher training at every level has to be viewed as an entirely non-negotiable and continuing process, especially in this incredibly fast-moving digital environment. The commitment of politicians and educational leaders to the best possible quality of teacher training, along with regular, preferably annual, paid time out for professional development, must become absolute. And that commitment, that compact, if you will, between government and the world of education must in every respect be an honest two-way affair. Fourth and last, we have to find a better and more consistent way with which to engage parents. 
A recent PISA research study highlights this issue and offers statistics to underline its importance. It's a subject I'd love the opportunity to discuss at length on another occasion. As I've said, getting our education system right is the whole ball of wax, and here's why. A world-class education system, and only a world-class education system, can, over time, deliver a world-class health service, as well as securing world-class pensions, along with a world-class infrastructure. The reverse can never, ever, ever be possible. It's also worth mentioning that current research increasingly links improved education to improved health and life expectancy. So in every respect, educational expenditure is a win-win, both for the individual concerned and for society in general. I share this with Michael Gove. I believe that economic growth alone can never deliver a better society, certainly the type of society that he or I would wish to live in. In fact, I believe that the current model of Western capitalism is, to all intents and purposes, absolutely broken. So I'd like to finish with a recent quote from Chandran Nair, the founder of a Hong Kong-based think tank, which very much resonated with me. He said, we need a fundamental restructuring, essentially about how people will live. And we need to move beyond simple questions about growth to more sophisticated, nuanced discussion about human progress. That is not the same as suggesting that economic growth will be able to deliver eye toys and cars to everyone. That's simply not possible. That is where capitalism has essentially hit a wall. And that is why a very different conversation needs now to take place. If, this is my fault, my view, and it's a very big if, if we can get the fundamentals of our education system right, then that very different conversation can take place. But we have to ask ourselves, are we going to spend the next five to ten years joining the blame game which would appear to dominate political discourse in the Palace of Westminster? Or are we going to get on with the job of digging this nation out of its present unholy mess while they continue to squabble? Only a brilliantly educated and committed generation of young people will see this country safely into the second half of this century. And only an equally brilliant and committed generation of teachers can make that possible. Many of them happen to be here in this hall. And without doubt, the best decision of my life was made 15 years ago when I decided to come and work, and work amongst you. So in conclusion, all I can say is thank you for all those years ago welcoming me as a colleague and indeed for listening to me this afternoon. Thank you. Generous. Thank you, Lord Putnam. We, we have a few minutes for some questions, and uh, there, are, there are colleagues in the audience with paddles, so if we could identify anybody that would like to ask a question, if you could raise your hand, please, and we'll get to you as quickly as we possibly can. Okay, so we'll be on three. Hello, Hello, Lord Putnam. I heard you speak about 18 months ago, and you talked about redefining literacy, or the concept of literacy in terms of media literacy, do you still think we are um, assessing and testing literacy in an archaic way? Essentially, yes. I mean, the, the, most, the easiest applause line for someone in an audience like this is to make the case, and I'm now, I would have said this 10 years ago, so I've got to move on a little, is to claim that we are attempting to put together a 21st century education system and still contending with a 19th century assessment process. And I think that is, there's a profound truth to that. I think there are efforts, and certainly there are, dare I say, technologies and people out there who are beginning to wrestle with the problem and maybe even wrestle with it successfully. But I, yes, I do think so. I think one of our problems is, and it's a very real problem, uh, there's a marvellous book by a woman called Cathy Davidson. Cathy Davidson was the professor of education at Duke University in the United States. And she makes the point in her book that we're very, very good at being critical about what kids aren't and about the, as it were, the defects in learning and the impact, if you like, on, on the plethora of, 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 of digital interruptions to their lives. And we're quite bad at really assessing and celebrating what they are becoming. That they, they do have extraordinary uh, facility for being at thinking ad, in an agile sense 
uh, that there are all sorts of things happening in a, as it were, in an audiovisual world that uh, many of us, including myself, find really quite difficult to keep up with. Um, so in that sense, yes, I think we, the, our, our default assessment process is still looking at what kids are losing by, by adopting the technology they're adopting rather than assessing what they're gaining from those self-same technologies. It's a debate that must go on. It's a complicated debate, but I think it's got to be a far more equal debate looking at the pros as well as the cons. We're pretty good at the cons. We're not very good at assessing, evaluating, and understanding the pros. Right, someone else, let me have someone here at the front, possibly paddle four. Sorry. Thank you. If you could stand as well, please, so we could see that, we would be very grateful. Thank you. Um, I was very interested with what you were saying about ICT teaching and how essentially it's, you know, it should be about coding, not about um, how to use Microsoft Office, which is what I've seen it be about most. You know, how, how do you write a Word document or write a spreadsheet? How do we redress that? Is that a problem about teacher recruitment or teacher training or the curriculum? How do we get this kind of more programming and computer science in the ICT curriculum? There's no, there's no magic bullet, no simple answer. I think it's about all those things. It is about teacher recruitment. It is a, certainly about professional training. I went along the other day, this may make, make you giggle, but I thought it was an interesting thing to do. I went along to Eton College to see what they were doing uh, about ICT, and it was a very, very informative few hours I spent there. First of all, they hadn't, been, they hadn't grappled with ICT all that long. I think the, their, their kind of serious engagement with ICT was only about four or five years. Uh, and the head, I think, was generally making a joke, said at lunch to me, uh, of course, we rather felt that the type of boys we have here had other people that did that sort of thing. <laughs> uh, hey, he, there you go. You can't blame him, really. Uh, but uh, I, I thought that the three guys that I met who were, who were the, as it were, the, uh, the ICT team uh, were terrific, really, really terrific. And there was a moment, a lovely moment, where I actually was mentioned, talked about coding, and the head of the team, the senior of the three, said, oh, I give my eye teeth to understand coding. And so what you realize is, now the snapshot there is, there's Eaton with all of its resources and everything else, teaching young people about ICT, with, but no one in the school understands coding. And it is a problem. I would suggest three things. Number one, we need to kind of address this as a serious pedagogical issue. Um, we need something rather better than, than the computers for dummies. Uh, so th it is an issue. Secondly, teaming up with local companies, if you could, who actually do have someone that does understand coding or is involved in the creation of websites, uh, so that they come in and on an ad hoc basis, maybe, and start helping staff through. And thirdly, I just want to make it very clear what, what I mean by uh, coding. Coding is a language. Coding is the building blocks by which the technologies that all of us use every single day are created. And like anything else, if you don't fundamentally understand it, you are only skimming across the top of the potential of actually what you're engaged with. I know very well indeed, I don't do 10% or use 10% of what my computer can do. In the case of my iPad, probably 5% of what it can do. I think I'd be better at it if I understood the, the, the as it were, the building, the building blocks that made it possible. I never will, it's too late for me. So coding, I think, is not something that needs to be put in a drawer and someone says, well, it's, you know, it's, it's a geek subject. It isn't a geek subject. It's no more a geek subject than really understanding the way in which letters are built into sentences, which are built into, built into paragraphs, which are built into narrative. It is, it is that fundamental. And I think we've sort of been a bit lazy. I think we've overlooked it. And I, I use the, the sort of slightly jokey phrase, we have tended to put it straight back in the too difficult drawer because we really know how to wrestle with it. But I, th I think the point is, all three, deal with people, if you can, locally, who can come and help you, certainly address it in terms of professional development, and God knows it needs to be developed uh, within part and, as part and parcel of the teacher training uh, offering within all of our teacher training institutions. Okay, well, let's stand, please. Thank you. Hey, can I ask, I mean, I, I don't disagree with you at all, but what I'm concerned about is none of that is in the government's vision. There are no exams, sorry, but not as far as I'm aware anymore, that talk about programming or coding, although I do know they did exist, and I have a colleague who built see-through computers so the kids could see how things worked. So what you're asking schools to do is to go down a route 
which actually there are no guidelines for, no support for, no fan financing for, which I think we do do that kind of thing anyway, but in an increasingly fragmented an educational environment where we have a government, as, which as you say, does not talk about ICT and actually is living in the 19th century. So I just wonder what sort of um, support is there out there for schools in terms of developing that bigger vision of how they could change pedagogy to develop this sort of digital age where actually there are no overarching, um, there is no overarching vision. Well, it's a great question, and I hope very, very much that if I'd done nothing else this afternoon, it would encourage one or two of you to, to put that question to the Secretary of State. I was very careful here. <laughs> I think, I think he knows. I think he hasn't yet managed to convince all of his colleagues, one of whom are certainly technophobic, um, and, and I, think, I think he's struggling with it. But I think the very fact that he hears it from you is helpful. What he would say, were he here, is yes, of course we want all of that, but we don't want to be mechanistic about it. We don't want to create rigid, rigidities. I asked a question, I can say this to you quite honestly because it's enhanced art, so no point in hiding. I asked a question during the education bill a couple of weeks ago, of, and I happen to like the, uh, the Lords Minister, uh, uh, Jonathan Hill, very much indeed. He's a very sound, sensible man. Uh, and we were talking about uh, various things, and I raised the whole issue of Phil Willis tried to get an amendment through to establish a framework for ICT, just a framework. We weren't asking for a lot, just a, 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 an agreed framework. And it was resisted from the front, Tory front bench. Uh, and I asked a question. I said, look, that's something I don't understand here. Are you suggesting that a school can be, can be ticked off as a successful school, maybe even a celebrated school, that has no ICT offering. And there was long, long silence. And the answer I got back, check hands out, was essentially yes. Because the alternative was, in their, in their judgment, that they would have to be prescriptive. And they're so determined not to be prescriptive that they won't even do the thing that they know they've got to do if the kids at our school is going to get jobs. So that's how bonkers this debate has become. I'm not being rude. I think it's complicated, but they've got to realise that every now and then as a government, you are required to be a little bit prescriptive because if you allow a technophobic head, and there must be some, a technophobic head to get away with the notion that his kids are not going to learn ICT, but he can still have a successful school, we're in a lot of trouble, and so are the kids at his school. Well, I think that's all we have time yeah. for, unfortunately. Could you join me again, please? Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.